The first Australians number more than 250 tribes, each with their own language, laws and territorial boundaries. A civilization encompassing the entire continent. We've had this debate about Australia was a terra nullius and it was a wasted landscape and people hadn't used it and hadn't farmed it. They've discovered that, in fact, it's probably supported about 1.6 billion lives. And that's how productive Aboriginal people were able to make this part of the earth which has the most irregular and unreliable rainfall and the driest continent on earth. 80,000 years, 100,000 years, doesn't matter whether it's 60,000 years, it's an incredible length of time. It's the longest living civilization on earth and if you can't learn something from a people that successful, then uh, you're really defying your own intelligence. Just over 200 years ago, without warning, strangers arrive. They appear on the east coast at a place called Warang. The strangers name it Sydney. They are about to come face to face with the first Australians. It is a summer's night on the 25th of January, 1788. Eleven giant ships enter the harbour. On board are over 1,300 people. More than half are convicts, the rest are soldiers. The people on board are ordered to remain there until dawn. They've travelled for nearly eight months from England to this unknown land. Around the harbour, the first Australians light fires and they yell from their canoes for these apparitions to go away. They thought they was the devil when they landed first. They did not know what to make of them. When they saw them going up the masts, they thought they was possums. Marut, Gamagal people. At first light, the order is given for the convict men and women to disembark. And for Aboriginal people, can you imagine? Suddenly there are 11 ships of these strange people wearing clothes, but funny hats, they have guns. What are these people up to? Why are they here? How long are they going to stay? Why did they come to my country? Why don't they go somewhere else? Are they spirits? Very strange. There's this very curious and very touching attempt to come together and to comprehend. So you have these extraordinary scenes within two or three days of landing of Britishers and Aborigines dancing together. 29th of January, 1788. They pointed with their sticks to the boat landing place and met us in the most cheerful manner. Shouting and dancing, these people mixed with ours and all hands danced together. William Bradley, first lieutenant. And all we've got to go on are the paintings done by a young naval lieutenant called Bradley. And he has these enchanting paintings of redcoats and Aboriginal men, indeed, dancing together. They're hand in hand. They seem to be dancing. A sort of playground encounter, if you like, when you're trying to check each other out. The first Australians can't work out if these visitors are men or women, as their clothing covers them like a strange skin. Finally, an officer is challenged to submit to the country's very first immigration procedure. He has a wig, he has leotards on. They ask him to take his pants off, which he declined and made a sailor do it. Arthur Phillip, captain of the First Fleet, leads the newcomers ashore. After an unremarkable career of 30 years in the Navy, he is dragged from retirement and appointed governor of a place nearly 60 times the size of England. 
Governor Phillip was in a rather unique situation when he came to Sydney because he had one of his front teeth missing. And it was the same tooth that was knocked out during the male initiation ceremony. On my showing them that I lacked a front tooth, it occasioned a general clamour, and I thought gave me some little merit in their opinion. Arthur Phillip, Governor. The local people would have thought, here is a man who's initiated, here is an elder, a senior person, so this is somebody we can negotiate with, this is somebody we can talk to, because he has shared at least one of our ceremonies, he's missing his front tooth. Philip has spent a year in London preparing for the journey, and like Noah, he gathers together humans, animals and supplies. There are 44 sheep, four cows, one bull, his own greyhounds, tents, farming equipment, wine and seeds. Philip has also taken on board 700 hatchets, 74,000 nails, 50 pickaxes and 700 clamp knives. All this he takes to win over the first Australians, according to his instructions. These instructions also direct Philip to occupy the land of the first Australians, which they now see as British territory. Instructions for our well-beloved Arthur Philip, Esquire, Governor of New South Wales. You are to endeavour, by every possible means, to open an intercourse with the natives and to conciliate their affections, enjoining all our subjects to live in amity and kindness with them. Lord Sydney, Secretary for the Home Department. The Home Office was rather good at issuing orders controlling the interactions of the British with any natives they encountered. They put a great deal of time and thought into it, and most of them were absolutely utopian. On the ground, it wasn't like that. The justification for taking the land was that Aboriginal people were animals. And to engage with people on an individual basis and to acknowledge that the history of those people meant that they were people. Immediately he orders trees be chopped down and the land to be cleared. They erect tents, an area for the convict women separate from the men, a blacksmith, a hospital and a store. Invisible to Philip are the clearly defined territories of the Sydney clans. On the North Shore are the Barogagal and Gamaragal lands and on the South the Birribirigal, the Gadigal, and Benelong's people, the Wongal. They did incomprehensible things, and they treated each other with vile cruelty. The first Australians are quickly learning about this military society from a distance. They realise that the men wearing red are armed and are to be avoided. Aboriginal people watching must have been horrified. Within the space of a week or so, there were 1,100 people in their country and they would have been outnumbered. Before Philip can conciliate the affections of the natives, in 1789, disaster strikes. An extraordinary calamity was now observed among the natives. Repeated accounts brought by our boats are finding bodies of the Indians in all the coves and inlets of the harbour. Pustules, similar to those occasioned by smallpox, were thickly spread on the bodies. But how a disease could at once have introduced itself and then spread so widely seemed inexplicable. What can touch? How did it come to Australia? I think there's such a debate and there's such speculation that we can't know definitively, but in my own mind, it's clear that it came with the first fleet. <laughs> 